welcome everyone uh, to the event, Rethinking Alternatives with Marx. I'd like to quickly introduce uh, the lead co-producer of the event, Michael Lardner. Hi. Hello, I'm Michael from the Marxist Education Project. Many of you know, because many of you come to our events, that we are the continuation of the, the New York Marxist School that began in the village uh, 1975. Uh, we continue and uh, I'm just coming in today from our every Saturday morning uh, Grundrisse group that meets with people from around the world. We are making a slow but steady progress. Upcoming events that we have uh, include uh, our very first event after the into the new year will be an appearance by Mark Jay and Phil Conklin, who have written A People's History of Detroit, and they will be presenting on that on Saturday, January 8th. We just yesterday uh, found out that Michael Hart will be joining in with Marcello uh, Musto on uh, March 19th for a presentation on Marcello's book on Karl Marx's writings on alienation, which include not just the early works of Marx, but all through Marx's writings on alienation and should be a great discussion. We have a, a, a class that is beginning now on uh, Mesoroche's necessity of social control. This is a close reading group. It meets on Wednesdays at uh, five in the afternoon. Anyone is welcome to join. Uh, we have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning. There are people coming in from all over the world to our events. Our level of discussion has grown tremendously and I encourage anyone to uh, check us out at any time. And uh, in the interest of getting today's very broad and important panel together, I am stopping with announcements. Just visit our site, marksedproject.org and you will find a bevy of studies and panels and other cultural events coming up that will broaden our, our community as a lot and our understanding, hopefully. Uh, Kira, the flo Zoom floor is back to you. All right, thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. My name is Kira Mujayar, and I'm one of the co-producers of Shelter and Solidarity, a live left web series. You can keep up with our events on Facebook or on our website, shelterandsolidarity.org. You can find the links to those websites, including the Marxist Education Project, in the chat. And now I am pleased to introduce Marcello Musto, the editor of the book, Rethinking Alternatives with Marx, Economy, Ecology, and Migration. Marcello is a professor of sociology at York University in Toronto, Canada. His writings have been published worldwide in more than 20 languages. Mar Marcello, take it away. Thanks, Kira, and thanks, Michael. Uh, I cannot start this um, wonderful um, book lunch and session without thanking you two, and of course, also Baba Kamini. Without the three of you, without all your work, this event would not have been possible. And then, of course, I want to thank the Marxist Education Project, Encuentro 5, Shelter and Solidarity, Socialism and Democracy, the four organizer of uh, our talk today. So what is our talk today? Um, let me give you some uh, background. In 2019, in May 2019, it, it seems a long time ago, we had a wonderful conference. This is the flyer um, in Pisa. Um, the title of the conference, the name of the conference was Marx 201, Rethinking Alternatives. Why 201? Because um, I am always a little bit skeptical about this um, institutional celebrations and this idea of uh, turning Marx into a statue, right? So Marx 200, Marx 150. So we had a little bit of fun by saying 201. And um, we had um, a very big event with uh, uh, thousands of people, three days. We had eight sessions. And uh, we had session on capitalism, nationalism, democracy, migration, work, ecology, religion, uh, gender, and communism. And uh, later we decided to, of course, um, published the, the proceedings of this uh, conference. Well, more than the proceeding, we try to organize our work in a, in a volume that was more focused around some um, um, issues. And this is the book 
I can show you the cover. This wonderful cover, actually, I like it very much, made by uh, Joe Guidone. The title of the book is Rethinking Alternative with Marx, as you said, Kira, Economy, Ecology, and Migration. I will be back to this in a couple of minutes. I just want to say that the book is published in the series that I um, edit at Palgrave uh, Macmillan. The title of the series is Marx, Angles, and Marxism. And uh, we just reached 60 volumes. For us, this is a very um, you know, important um, target. The series is actually very young. And we have more than 75 new volumes for coming under contract. So we quickly became uh, um, a flagship series at Palgrave Macmillan. We just signed 29 contracts this year, and we signed 34 in 2020 and um, 30 in 2019. I'm sharing the series with you so you can see many other volumes, including a couple of books published by my friend Michael Brie. I have only his uh, book about Lenin, rediscovering Lenin, um, but uh, there is another one about uh, Rosa Luxemburg, just to mention books published by our speakers. So I'm very grateful once again to Babakamini, to the other editorial assistants, to my co-editor Terrell Carver for all the hard work that we are doing with this series. Back to the book, and therefore back to our you know, lunch today and discussion today. I want to say that this volume is divided in, uh, in four parts. There are uh, 13 chapters here. Uh, the first part is called Capitalism, Gender, and Social Relations. And actually, we are very lucky to have two of the writers uh, of this um, volume, of this part, Imani Banerjee and Silvia Federici. Then there is a chapter for, from, by Bob Jessup, for example. The second part is called um, Enver Environmental Crisis and the Struggle for Nature. So there are chapters of Koei Saito, and um, one of the authors of this uh, part is Gregory Clays, again, another speaker today. We have no um, representative for part three, um, a very interesting one, actually, about migration, labor, and globalization. But we have Michael Bree representing the fourth part of the volume that is called Communism as a Free Association. So why we decided to focus on these topics, gender, ecology, migration, um, usually not um, related to Marx, because we wanted to have a, a conference and then a book later, uh, a book that, by the way, is under translation in Italian, under negotiation with um, China for translation in Chinese. So there is a lot of attention into this um, thematic only recently um, related to Marx in the last uh, couple of decades. We did not want to just talk about the critique of political economy in Karl Marx, right? That is perhaps the topic that um, brought back Marx to attention following the economic crisis of 2008. We wanted to discuss better the political elaboration of Marx. And by doing this, in many chapters of this volume, we have um, contribution of scholars that are working on the Marx Engels, Gesamtaus Gabe, the new edition of Marx. So people working with new manuscripts, new materials, including the uh, notebook that Marx wrote and um, in which he um, uh, elaborated some topics that he could not transform into writings, into articles, into books, because they were written in the last decade of his life. But um, you will hear more about this, of course, um, during our lunch, and it is time for me to stop this introduction. I just want to take one extra minute to let you know about what we are going to do today. So we have a, a, a packed session, a very condensed session. We have four speakers. Um, I ask them to um, present their chapters within 12 minutes each. Um, and then after this block of, let's say, 48, 50 minutes, we will take questions. And I will say, you know, we can go for um, three, five questions, or we can start the Q&A. Let's say that we will have two rounds. So every speaker will have two, three, four minutes later to respond to questions, and there will be at least two rounds. And then in the end, you know, Kira and Michael will say uh, a few final words. So it is um, time to start. And the first speaker that we have today is uh, um, uh, Professor Gregory Clays, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of London. Um, he is author of many wonderful books, is by the way, a concurrent because you also have a wonderful book series at Palgrave Macmillan on Utopia. 
Um, I cannot mention all the work that he has done, but I can say that um, scholars like me, like Nicole Bree, are very, very uh, excited about his uh, next uh, book, uh, more than 500 pages. Greg, you tell me if I'm wrong. This is scheduled for July 2022 with Princeton University Press. And the title of this book will be Utopianism for a Dying Planet. Of course, recently, among his many publications, Gregory Clays has also published Marx and Marxism, Penguin Book 2018. So Greg, 12 minutes for you. And uh, I'm very pleased to have you here with us today. Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Clays, and I'm speaking from London. And thank you so much, Marcello, and to the other organizers for inviting me along today. I take it that everyone present here is aware that our collapsing environment is the single greatest threat humanity has ever faced. So, obvious question, how can Marx help us attain a sustainable society? While I regard Marx somewhat heretically as a utopian in the sense of someone who provides a clear vision of an ideal future of a type we obviously require, this is of course hardly uncontentious and classifying him as a proto-environmentalist thinker is also not unproblematic. Let me briefly outline the ambiguity which I think underlies this problem. Marx's chief statement of his utopian aspirations, the programmatic manifesto of the Communist Party of 1848, offered a detailed account of future organization which offered no tribute to the more ascetic forms of earlier utopianism. This was an industrial plan and one committed to extending production to increase the standard of living of the working classes in particular. From 1848 onwards, Marx insisted that a high level of industrialization could alone provide this opulence and ensure that all round development and universal education resulted. Just how the produce of industry would be consumed, he did not consider at much length. He obviously assumed that the excessive egoism and materialism associated with capitalist consumption would disappear. The working classes at that time, of course, mainly lacked decent food and housing. Marx evidently thought that their needs would expand as their standard of living rose. The manifesto observed that, I quote, in place of the old wants satisfied by the productions of the country, we find new wants requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes. The Gründrisse noted in passing that, I quote again, what earlier appeared as luxury is now necessary, and so-called luxury needs appear, e.g., as a necessity for the most natural industry rooted in the most basic natural need. There was no reason to presume this pattern would alter under socialism. Marx was, moreover, a stalwart anti-Malthusian and never conceded that the world would even in principle be overpopulated vis-a-vis -vis its natural resources which at that time is reasonable position to adopt. So communism implied a growth in demand, production, and population. The presumption of expanding needs, however, meant that the eventual goal of rewarding people on the principle drawn from Morelli and Babeuf via the Saint-Simonians and Cabet, from each according to his abilities, to each according to his needs, is only superficially simple. Marx acknowledged that individual needs varied for, another quote, one worker is married, another not, one has more children than another, et cetera, et cetera, thus given an equal amount of work done and hence an equal share in the social consumption fund, one will in fact receive more than another, one will be richer than another, et cetera, end of the quote. An expansion of needs would also be driven by other factors. The so-called all-round development of human character implied cultivating higher and more cultural sides of the self, indeed for the majority well beyond the norms of capitalism. This was also an essentially urban ideal, as Marx's caustic comments on the bourgeoisie rescuing a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life indicate. But in cities, needs multiplied much more rapidly than on the land, as they indeed still do. What is paradoxical about this projected affluence is that Marx's early writings, of course, acknowledge the profoundly corrosive effects of commercial society upon character. And this is one basis for an environmentalist recasting of Marx, not the only one, but one. The Paris manuscripts of 1844 indicate a utopia of psychological wholeness 
as well as of economic justice, where all forms of alienation would be superseded under communism and humanity reunified with nature, which implies a non-exploitative relationship with human beings as well as with nature. Marx described commerce as a system which bred alienation, where money led each to regard, quote, his will, his activity, and his relation to other men as a power independent of him and them. In commerce, Marx suggested, people did not see each other as human, so things lose the significance of human personal property. Exchange, however, might be made equivalent, Marx again, to species I think you were muted, Greg, can you? We can hear you, right? Okay, yeah. Right. Now you're back, thank you. Te technical hitch, no problem. So let me go back a sentence. Mark, in commerce, Mark suggested people did not see each other as human, so things lose the significance of human personal property. Exchange, however, might be made equivalent, Marx again, to species activity and species spirit. The real conscious and true mode of existence which is social activity and social enjoyment. This incidentally is the leitmotif of the book that uh, Marcello uh, just mentioned. Money need not corrupt relationships. Marx again, assume man to be man, or as we would say today, a human being to be a human being, and his or their relationship to the world to be a human one, then you can exchange love only for love, trust for trust, etc. If we consider how Marx was interpreted in the 20th century in particular, it is evident that his followers thought his system heralded great improvements in both morality and intellectual capacity. His aspirations for humanity's advancement were captured in Leon Trotsky's famous boast that in future, at least eventually, the average human being will rise to the heights of an Aristotle, a Goethe or a Marx. But this ideal was rarely linked to the expectation that fewer material goods would be desired. The assumption that behavior would be more peaceable and orderly, that people would be less disposed to violence and cruelty where relative social equality existed, does underscore the idea that a higher morality was a key aim of the future society. Yet there's little consensus with respect to how needs would fit into this ideal. Some think Marx and Engels viewed the ideal proletarian as, quote, a paragon of virtue, a hero of virtue, who did not indulge in the imminent gratification of his needs. This implies an ascetic, even Spartan, component in Marx's inheritance. To Hans Jonas, however, material prosperity has been what Jonas calls a causal condition for Marxist utopia. Then there's the question of public luxury. Like the early socialists, many later Marxists thought that economy of effort would bring about large scale communal kitchens where the German social democrat August Bebel, for example, surmised cooperative cooking with a large central kitchen and machinery would liberate millions of women from private drudgery. Marx was often seen, as San Francisco Brandt of the International put it, as opposing luxurious idleness, not luxury as such. So luxury could be collective and extended to all. As Kristen Ross shows, some of these themes were tentatively explored during the brief experiment of the Paris Commune of 1871, defined not just by social equality, but a communal luxury, the phrase itself was used, which entailed, quote, transforming the aesthetic coordinates of the entire community, Ross's words. This complex legacy was played out during the history of the USSR. I look at some of it in the coming utopianism book. The more Spartan and egalitarian extremes were witnessed under Mao, and Pol Pot in particular, while Russian and European Marxism opted for public over private luxury initially, but eventually bowed to demands for consumer goods. So let me summarize by way of conclusion. Marxism presents us with an ambiguity respecting the need to resist the commodification of the self, which was a key theme in 1844, and the need to extend the standard of living of the working class in principle indefinitely. This is exemplified both in Marx's own writing and in the history of consumerism in the USSR, the most important experiment in Marx's ideas, where a slow shift away 
from a preference for public over private luxury is apparent. What we need to do now, that is to say in the coming decades, is to reverse this process and opt again for public over private luxury. Here, one part of Marx's legacy still has a great deal to offer, the transition to sustainability. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Greg. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I just want to remind that uh, Gregory Scalise's chapter in the book is called Marx and um, Environmental Catastrophe. So now we go um, back to the first part of the book. The book is um, Rethinking Alternative with Marx. Um, it is an expensive book, like books of this publishing houses, but uh, very soon we will have a, a paperback edition and uh, you know, if you happen to write an email to the editor of this book, who is me, you might get an attachment you know, by mere accident with a PDF of the volume. If you want to read it very much, this will not be a catastrophe for the publishing house, uh, but the paperback will be usually out after 12 months of the publication. So part one of the book is Capitalism, Gender and Social Relation. I already mentioned that we have two authors uh, of this um, of this part of the book, and one of them, actually, this is the, the first chapter of the book, is um, Himani Banerjee. Himani is a, a colleague and a friend, Himani, if I may, at um, my same department at York University, Department of Sociology. She's an emeritus professor. Like for Gregory Cleese before, she has written too many books and uh, not too wonderful, but too many books to mention all the titles. I just want to mention the title of the last one that uh, came out um, for Brill in 2020, The Ideological Condition, Selected Essay on History, Race and Gender. Hundreds of pages, very wonderful. Um, and the chapter that Imani wrote for this book is called The Factory and the Family as Spaces of Capital. Imani, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for everything, Marcello, and also the organizers. Uh, Kira and Babak both deserve a lot of uh, thanks from me. Uh, Kira instructed me quite carefully. I don't much know about computers, and I feel well looked after by uh, the instructions she sent. And I will try now to do something um, which is I'll read a bit what I have because I think uh, given that uh, the article is longish and I think I just want to point out certain basic things and leave the others uh, for actually the reading by people if they should be tempted after what they hear uh, to pursue reading the article. Now, um, I, I also want to uh, recognize the fact that this uh, piece that I'm reading and the article itself might remind people of an extremely important uh, field that is developing in, uh, in social reproduction theory but I have not used that as my point of departure, but tried to track a different um, you know, path to what I think would, could, we could use to go towards social, socialist transformation and a communist revolution. Now, The Factory and the Family is my title as Spaces of Capital. It is a part of a project on the bourgeois family, gender, and class that I hope to complete in the coming year. The final part towards a communist revolution, the first part, sorry, towards a communist revolution, gender and class in capital, volume one, is included in, um, in Marcello Musto's book on uh, 2018 Marxist Capital, after 150 years. Uh, in it, I attempted to demystify the so-called woman question of the 19th century social reformers by exploring the exclusion of women from the status of revolutionary 
agents as manifested by the male typology of the harbingers of the communist revolution, namely the composite figure called the proletariat. Uh, by creating a homologous relationship among women, gender, and the family, this present essay complements the other by showing how the family, inclusive of all its denizens, that is deeply connected to class consciousness and class struggle and is a revolutionary site or can be a revolutionary site. My notion of the family, of course, here, runs parallel with some aspects of what is termed as social reproduction, institutions with heteropatriarchal norms and forms sanctioned positively by the church and the state. So for me, the term makes a paradigm shift by signaling to diverse and complex social arrangements that are possible in their socio-historical moments, not just a fixed notion of what the family is, both form and content, but actually a changing uh, content, though under the rubric of the name, of the title, the family. Uh, the La family, therefore, serves to remind us of the basic facts of our existence, of active, affective, productive, and reproductive life maintained for the purpose of securing life. Up to now, families have uh, served as relational existential spaces where people live from birth to death, express their sexuality, bring up children, care for the aged and the ailing. D does it uh, essentially, eternally have to be so? Will family always be the place where this is all done? And it, uh, my answer is no. We have historical instances and can now see under other prefigurations of potentially life originating and supporting forms that question gender in a, that really question the division of gender inabilities. But so far, the business of life and living, particularly with the rise of capitalism, is still tied to space complexes that clarify my use of the term and the family serves as a broad signifier of for existential social grouping, whether formal or informal, all productions and their reproduction are fundamentally meant for and realized in this existence. I'm aware that the family in its various aspects of including gender, labor, political consequences has been much written about. My intention is not to replicate that scholarship, but rather to expand on what follows when we attend it to, uh, from an intrinsic and necessary dimension of the overall space of capital considered as a socio-historical rather than an economic calculus uh, of, of production of surplus value. And uh, there, but it is not detached from, but inclusive of political economy, but not exactly centered on it. I don't start here from capital's function of exploitation or generation of value, though it is perfectly pertinent to do so as many others have with other intentions in mind. I'm therefore not engaging with how much value Familial activity is sometimes considered as social reproduction, irrespective of the types and process of these forms co contribute to capital. My concern here is not what women's share in uh, the overall value produced by capitalist production should be, or even whether or not women per se, as qua women, should be seen as full members of the proletariat and partisan to the class struggle and to class struggle and revolution as I did in my first article. But rather I want to expose the hidden social spaces and productive moments created through capital, capital's growing organization produced in the process itself, visibilities 
and invisibilities of spaces. The complex med mediations necessary for capital's unavoidable expansion have made capital a Manichaean entity, resulting in social divisions that have over time eclipsed connections between life and work, production and expressive creativity, and false spatial disjunctions such as the public and the private, another trick of visibility and invisibility that develops in the course of capital's development of necessity rather than intentionally uh, planned by somebody. The most significant among capital's capacity to hide the obvious way is the obvious wage form or the commodity fetishism has been much, much discussed from this point of view. The process of exploitation itself which generates surplus value. It has not been done so in any other mode of production that this particular hiding process of immanent, uh, making it immanent the process of labor in the production of surplus value. It is not a surprise that in capital's particular space-time conjunction, the existential space, individualized and atomized, should become a necessary but an infrastructural aspect of capital's overall organizational form. Composed with various types of human activities performed with different kinds of productive forces, the family and the factory the space of direct production must have a distinct difference from each other, though as a whole, they add up to the total organization of capitalist mode of production. Marx talks about the, in the Grundrisse about production and consumption and consumption product, consumptive production and vice versa to uh, key us into the kind of process that I'm trying to delineate. The invisibility and the physicality of the existential familial space is integral to the space of exploitation, which pays a wage publicly, uh, valorizes technological forces and undermines human labor as the sine qua non of any production. Uh, that People are actually working at what they're producing is visible in feudalism very overtly because of the oppressive direct form in which they're producing and being uh, uh, extracted from, whereas capital has internalized the entire process and thereby naturalized the wage form as something we don't even think about, just live with it. Capital's game of hide and seek comes to an end when we begin our critical inquiry, not from the question of how much value is generated by what kind of work or in what sphere, but from the spaces of people's everyday existence. The element of time in capitalist production has been thoroughly analyzed by Marx and Marxist, particularly in the way it contributes to the production of commodities and is implicated in the production of value, particularly of surplus value. We are familiar with Taylorism and time motion studies to indicate the role of clocks and uh, timing in the process of production. At this level, time is converted into fuel for the feeding of productive forces to the point that human capacity through labor reaches its end and therefore has to be aided by the development of technology. Human body measures the limit of how much labor can be exploited. And then comes technology. Capital's use of time strips human activity in the process of production of its sensuousness, personal artistic capacities, bodily experiences, and converts them into an entity which is quantifiable to a nanosecond by the time motion engineers. The space of capital signified by the factory stands for this translation of time and subordination of human labor into mere quantity, a qualityless non-human and averaged out phenomenon. In this essay, I oppose capital's time, 
with its specific constellation of space-time activities against that of the family, our existential space, by default. Doesn't have to be, but that's where we have been and are for a long time. Here, time is marked with quality and activities uh, which produce goods, which are not, sorry, which are not uh, commodities. Uh, but uh, uh, here, people are born in personally connected social arrangements of some kind and die within them, though increasingly in more institutional ones with their care homes and in the outer space of sociality, which marks the death of the bare body of the homeless. This existential space is the constant antagonism to the encroachment of capital's time and its forced oppressive and exploited labor. Under capitalism, all labor is ultimately forced labor, since the entire edifice stands on the bedrock of an ongoing primitive accumulation and disposition and all accessibility of necessities of life through the market. Antagonism between these two spaces of life and of production for profit necessitates the formative relation between two kinds of activities what we call natural and we call uh, the mechanical or uh, labor pertaining to capital and even working out as the concept of abstract labor. As without nature, there is nothing to labor on and anyone who can labor, uh, we can see that uh, capital manipulates nature in every sense in order to uh, begin and continue its existence. Seen in this way, human capacity, which resides in embodied conscious beings, in subject, is, uh, is subject to extraction as from a mine. Capital's organization is an instrument which uses human beings as gold or other uh, minerals to convert their productive capacities into labor for capital. Capital needs the entire spectrum of human energy and capacities at its disposal at all times. But in spite of this, capital cannot exhaust or negate most of the capacities that human beings have. It employs human labor in a very selective kind of way as necessary, particularly within its uh, intention and the types of goods or labor processes it has. There is an excess of, um, excess of, uh, of energy and abilities, forms of life and creativity, which capital doesn't need to or cannot use in the process of commodity production. Intrinsic human uh, characteristics stand in perpetual confrontation with capital. The abilities to feel, to imagine, to love, to empathize, to sympathize or care are properties of being human. And this human person is not the persona of the so-called the labor that we often talk about in economistic kind of ways of thinking about Marxism and Marx, uh, because it's a second level construction created for the needs of a particular transitory mode of production. The proof of this transitionality and artificiality of the persona of capital subject, uh, for example, think of Brecht's way of creating personas that embody types of the organization of labor, um, is uh, in fact the existence of real human beings. This persona depends on the person who can be varied and shifting while the persona of labor is fixed, has endured for millennia without actually capitalism. People have existed as people without capitalism all, in ca all these years, uh, but capitalism would make no sense or be realizable at all without the needs and capacities of human beings. 
the question we have to ask is why is this fact so forgotten? And why scholars who call themselves Marxists do not take seriously uh, Marx's statement that all acts of knowing or inquiry must begin from real lives of people and that existence determines consciousness, including the subjectivities that we have and not the other way around. Among many things I'm trying to do in this article, I try to take that statement of Marx's that we begin from real people of what actually happens their life very seriously. Therefore, I begin my project of social inquiry from social existence and its continuity, rather than from the view provided through the spatial window of the factory. My point of departure for understanding class consciousness and struggle therefore begins from the space of existence as signified by default by the family. However, non-modernist non or pre-capitalist activities might be, uh, as I include uh, it within the organizable sites of revolutionary class struggle. And in that, I think that there is actually a very great necessity within capital's organization to have um, uh, a mixed mode of production. Uh, where, you know, slavery and advanced forms of capitalism can go on together. Topographically, socially, of living very primitive, uh, village lives and bonded labor and uh, using everything manual and basic can go very well with uh, export oriented, uh, you know, economies. And so I think that it's really the uneven development of a certain kind that is reflected in social topography. Now, if class is to be treated uh, from the point of view of the social formation from existence, as more than an economic category, as mediating the whole mode of capitalist production, then seeds of resistance are therefore to be found also in the life and cultural spaces, which capital has not yet penetrated. Or if it has, it has also simulated or stimulated greater existential responses, as well as organized agencies against capital's uh, violence. At the heart of class struggle lies people struggle, trying to claw back from the, their, their own time of existence, from the expanding outreach of capital's time. With attention, this quotidian class struggle is always evident to us. The Communist Manifesto begins by talking about two forms of class struggle taking place simultaneously in our everyday life calling them open and hidden struggles of class. The familial space is the central site of such hidden struggles of class, where at the behest of being human, people perpetually create avenues and means for fighting capital. The overt open struggles of class, for example, through labor movements with political parties, which we typically designate as class struggle, actually rely on the subjects that live within everyday life, non-productive um, facilities of capital. And it relies on the larger environment where people claim their own dues from the society they live in. These political struggles are symbolically connected to the renewable energy and excess of capital's, gen capital's capacity, sorry, Reno uh, rely on uh, renewable energy and excess of capacities generated within experiential, social, and familial lives. Thank you, Amda. Thank you, Mani. Thank you very much. Um, I knew that you were very close to continue, and there are many questions for you, for other people. That's why I try to compress um, the uh, presentation within 12 minutes. Um, so um, as Kira just mentioned, she's being a co an excellent co-chair. She's sending links to the books of our school, books of the scholars who have been talking today, also links of the chapters of the book. And she just mentioned that you can start putting 
questions in uh, in the chat. So um, we are always discussing, still discussing the part one of our book, Capitalism, Gender and Social Relation. And the next speaker is another good friend of mine, Silvia Federici. Um, the um, title of the chapter is Marx on Gender, Race and Social Reproduction, a Feminist Perspective. Uh, professor Federici Silvia is a emeritus professor of political philosophy at Hofstra University. She has written many well-known books and, um, you know, I cannot mention all of them. I just want to say that in the past few years, she's writing a book a year, almost a book a year. And, you know, the last publication is called Patriarchy of the Wage, Notes on Marx, Gender and Feminism, published by PM Press in 2021. And Sylvia and I are also discussing the possibility of publishing a next book, uh, her next book in this series. So Sylvia, are you there? And, you know, 12 minutes for you. You should appear at some point. Hello? Yes. Yeah, greetings to you all and thank you, Marcello, for organizing this event and for the book. Uh, I'm going to make just very few statements, you know, that um, um, statement in line with uh, you know, what I've written over the years and uh, the main theme of the book on the question of Marx and gender, and also a statement that continue a whole analysis and critique of Marx that began in the 70s. There's much discussion today about social reproduction, but actually, you know, some of the basic uh, themes of uh, the conversation on social reproduction today were really laid out in the early 70s by, you know, uh, writers like Maria Rosa da Costa, Selma James, and others, who basically began to look at Marx and realize that, in fact, uh, despite the great learning that we can derive from it, there were a basic, basic uh, problem, particularly and not exclusively with his approach to the question of what is now called gender, and more broadly in the question of women's place in the organization of capitalist work and uh, the process of reproduction. So to make it my presentation to a set of theses, fundamentally, you know, what I've been writing through time and also in this article is that, you know, Marx's approach as important it has been to feminist theory, revolutionary theory uh, is um, fundamentally, you know, bias in that looks at the history of capitalism and the organization of capitalist exploitation from a very clear male viewpoint and particularly from the viewpoint of the male industrial worker. And uh, in fact, uh, women, the issue connected with gender, uh, the issue of reproduction, the issue of procreation, you know, have a very, very minimal uh, uh, presence in, uh, in the large body of, Cap of Marx's work. And uh, uh, in fact, you know, the women appear in Marx's work uh, only as cheap labor in, in the factory. Uh, there is no in Marx an understanding of how capitalism, capitalist development, and the process of capitalist accumulation is also an accumulation of labor hierarchy, an accumulation of uh, differences, structural differences that have become really a structural systemic part of capitalist development in all time, although continuously evolving. Uh, in other words, that one of the uh, characteristics of capitalist development has been precisely the fact that uh, it has used as one of its structuring elements, you know, patriarchal relation, racial relation, colonial, colonial relation, and so forth. Um, so the one of the theme of the article you know, is to look more in detail. Uh, first of all, in the first part, look more in detail at the consequences of this oblivion, oblivion to the question of gender, oblivion to the question of reproduction in Marx's work. Uh, one example, for instance, is that when Marx speaks of the reproduction of the working class, the reproduction of labor power, people's capacity to work, he understands this process of reproduction has been accomplished only exclusively through the market. 
Right? In other words, the workers receive the wage and buy the commodities that are necessary for the production of everyday life. No sex, uh, no housework, nothing for the preparation of meal, no washing of clothes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also, he does not see that in the very years in which he was working on capital, a large process of reform was underway. If, of course, he sees the expectors, he sees, of course, the expectors are going into the factories, and he hears some of the lamentation, you know, of the bourgeoisie, you know, concerning the consequences of women's absence from, from the family, from the home. But he doesn't really understand that the large process of reform was underway that in fact becomes very evident in the last part of the 19th century is the process whereby uh, you know, a, new, a new structure of reproductive work is organized you know, with the expulsion of women from the factory, you know, with the institution of, of a wage that uh, you know, is patriarchal is intended to support you know, a reproductive wife, et cetera. And so this transformation, this historic transformation of the family, which in fact has had a major, major roles, political role as well, in terms of the pacification you know, of large sectors of the working class and uh, the creation of, 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 a, of a, a, a co almost commonality of interest or complicity by large sectors of the male proletariat, you know, that um, in exchange for the exploitation in the factory, in the offices, is also being given, you know, a person who can now serve his needs and uh, in, in all capacity, sexual, physical, emotional. So this is a very important, important uh, uh, oblivion, uh, mission. In, you know, in, in, in Marx's work. And uh, I, in the article, I trace a connection between uh, Marx's uh, inability to see the patriarchal, the systemic patriarchal character of capitalism, and also see the you know, uh, racial, um, racial, what today is now more commonly defined as racial capitalism that racialization is a systemic structural element, you know, from the beginning, is not a, a contingent, but structural uh, element. And uh, I show, for example, that even though Marx recognized the importance of the, of the struggle the, for emancipation and the importance of the anti-slavery movement, uh, nevertheless, when we read Capital, for example, in Capital One, you know, we see that uh, never he changed his conception of class, his conception that it is the industrial worker, the wage industrial worker, who is the, the revolutionary subject and who has the qualification for the transformation necessary to create a communist society. You know, Marx repeatedly, for example, you know, points out that the, the slave uh, only So you, you need to unmute again. Okay, the slave acts under the compulsion of the whip and doesn't have therefore the kind of educational process that is implicit in uh, the wage relation because the wage relation, Marx says, forces the worker to make choices, etc. cetera. I, I could elaborate more, but I, I don't want, I, I see that my time is already um, ending. And um, so uh, I think these are, these are important um, uh, experts of my article in the first uh, section. And uh, uh, I, I look also at, at some very macroscopic uh, you know, phenomena that uh, Marx did not see when he described you know, the proletariat, the industrial proletariat uh, of his time, for example, you know, the, the condition of subjection in which women lived, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the English proletariat, you know, even in the, in the last part of the 19th century, for example, you know, there were cases, and E.P. Thompson has written about it, you know, of women sold at the market, you know, that uh, one, uh, one standard or common for a while way of divorce, 
you know, uh, in the planet area was to bring the wife to the market with a yoke, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of uh, phenomenon tells us volume, you know, about, about the kind of devaluation of, of women's life that had been, uh, you know, taking place in the history of capitalism. Marx also, when he speaks of a primitive accumulation, never includes, you know, the, the killing, the big persecution, the great witch hunts that, uh, you know, bloodied Europe for almost three centuries, never acknowledged the existence of that persecutor, nor asked himself, even though Trier, his hometown, was actually one of the sites of uh, one of the major witch hunts in Europe. In the second part of the group, the, of, the, of the book, actually, I look at the reconstruction. How do we reconstruct Marx? Because Marx, nevertheless, has been extremely important. Even the critique that myself and many other women that I work with, you know, have made, the critique that, uh, you know, points to the, the consequences of Marx's uh, omission of the importance of gender. Even the critique actually was inspired by Marx, you know, because many of us, when we read how Marx described the reproduction of the workforce, you know, we saw immediately, we saw immediately, you know, the elephant in the room, that what was absent was housework. And that already told us that what we call housework, domestic work, is not a personal service, is not, you know, a, the legacy of a previous age, and so forth, but is actually productive work in the capitalist sense, in the Marxian sense of the work, is part of an organization of production that produces the capacity to work because it's not a work that occurs in a spontaneous way. It's course that is highly planned, highly regulated. Let's think, for example, just the regulation that the state, the bourgeois state, the capitalist state, as imposed on women, sexuality, marriage, and, and the procreation. And all those were not, uh, you know, is, issuing, were not issuing from uh, a moral or religious concern, but they were issuing from the fact the marriage, uh, marriage, uh, sexuality, and procreation were really integral part of the reproduction of the workforce. You know, had, a, had an economic dimension and economic value, and as well as a political and social value. Um, in conclusion, what does it mean to reintroduce gender you know, uh, into a Marxist perspective? I think in, it, in immensely, it's an immense contribution. It's an immense contribution, as it is an immense contribution to the think of capitalism, the history of capitalism from the point of view of the colonized and from the point of view of those who have been racialized, the point of view of those who have been enslaved. I think that it really we, we understand there is a level of understanding that uh, goes beyond Marx, that takes us beyond Marx. Um, and uh, for example, you know, the, the fact that today, you know, the, the process of reproduction has become directly you know, a, a, a process of even more directly than in the past, you know, a process of uh, exploitation. You know, we have seen, for example, the whole financialization of reproduction, for instance, you know, that has made, in fact, many activity directly, immediately productive and productive, not only from the point of view of their capacity to reproduce work, uh, whose, whose labor power would be then exploited in the future. Also, I think that uh, from a gender or a racial point of view, uh, we see that uh, Marx's assumption, and uh, here probably is this, there's a lot of controversy on this issue, but Marx's assumption of the progressivity of capitalism is something that we have to reject. You know, Marx's assumption is that capitalism lays the material condition for the creation of a communist society. We are seeing today that, in fact, in many ways, we could say that it's also destroying the material condition for the production of a communist society. You know, we're talking about entire, entire population that have been deprived and uh, for, for uh, centuries to come 
of the basic means of the reproduction, desertification and uh, uh, floods. Uh, I, again, I have no time to elaborate on it, but the consequences of the climate crisis and the consequences of the level of expulsion that uh, you know, we are witnesses, you know, um, really makes, have forced us to rethink the idea of the progressivity of capitalism and how capitalism sets the material basis. Yes, capitalism expands enormously you know, the, the productivity of labor and invents technologies that uh, you know, have um, you know, as almost uh, makes us think of science fiction. But nevertheless, those technologies we understand are not sustainable. Those technologies, the production of those technologies is now eating the earth, is now eating the earth. We're talking about, you know, Thomas Moore was speaking of sheep eating persons. Yeah, now we have technologies that are also eating the earth. So I think that when we see gender, gender means reproduction, the reproduction of life. We see that exploitation does not occur only in the factory or, or in the plantation for the matter, but of course in every, in every uh, reproductive activity and uh, on a much larger area. And then in fact, today, if we look at social movements across the planet, we see that the most intense struggle, life and death struggle, are the struggle over the condition of reproduction, are not necessarily taking place, you know, in factories, but are taking place by people who are displaced from their home, are taking place by people who want to regain control over their body. They're taking place on people who are struggling in order to be able to have the care, the health care to be that, uh, that they require. So I believe that Marx is still very important. There's a tremendous amount of, of uh, knowledge and insight that we can derive from Marx. And the very fact that Marx can make us think of capitalism as a system, as a whole, where all relations are interconnected, it's, it's something that uh, is irreplaceable. Uh, at the same time, I think that we need to go beyond Marx in order to be able to respond to the needs of the present. Thank you very much. Silvia, many thanks to you for your passionate intervention. So passionate that I will be, I would like to discuss with you, but I can't as a chair, I must um, continue with other presentation. But um, I must say that this question of the progressivity of capitalism and communism, etc. It's a perfect bridge to the next speaker, Michael Brie, um, because this is something that we debated a lot at the conference that we had in Pisa and that we tried to develop in this part of the book, Communism as a Free Association. Also indicated, uh, indicating many things that Marx foreseen, um, in particular, you know, in the last uh, part of his life. But Michael today, Michael Brie is a senior fellow and president of scientific board of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And I already mentioned one of his books published in our series at the beginning of the talk, Rediscovering Lenin. Let me just mention another wonderful book published on the occasion of the anniversary of Rosa Luxemburg. Is, the title is Rosa Luxemburg, a revolutionary Marxist at the limits of Marxism. So the title of um, um, Michael Brie um, chapter in this volume is Uniting Communism and Liberalism, an unsolvable task or a most urgent necessity. Michael, are you there? 12 minutes for you as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcello. And thank you uh, to all of you, to all the organizers, of course, of this uh, event. And I'm very glad, of course, I'm missing Pisa, Marcello, yes? <laughs> it looks like centuries ago when we met because now with the pandemic, it's a terrible situation uh, that we are just uh, speaking via, via Zoom. Um, of course, I'm challenged by the presentation now of um, Silvia Federici uh, about the progressivity or non-progressivity of capitalism because the, the, the problem behind my article in the book is um, of course, in fact, uh, going with Marx, 
beyond Marx somehow. It's the same problem, maybe from a, a different angel, of course. And when we are, Greg already started with this ecological catastrophe, we are now facing um, with the end of the unilateral dominance of the United States, a new Cold War. I think we should realize what that means. At the same time, we have this ecological catastrophe and a terrible um, started a new Cold War. Um, and how to deal with this um, uh, most fundamental uh, crisis of capitalist um, and uh, civilization. As you may know, almost exactly 30 years ago, on December the 31st of 1991, the red flag on the Kremlin was taken down mm -hmm. and the flag of the bourgeois Russian um, states, uh, white, blue, red, flag was hoisted. And it seemed at this time that um, the, the kind of world revolution of liberalism was um, uh, on the verge of uh, completion. But today now we see that something totally unexpected occurred in these last uh, 30 years with the People's Republic of China. It's also an elephant in the, in the room. Um, under the leadership of the Communist Party, a new challenger to Western liberalism has entered the scene and a challenger which is much more, much stronger than the Soviet Union ever was. The problem, uh, how is this possible and what that means for the future, for the future of the in the 21st century, um, especially, of course, with regard to the ecological problem, to the problem of uh, sustainable development goals of the UN. I think, um, and I learned a lot reading the books of uh, Silvia Federici, liberalism and communism are deeply opposed brothers. Uh, this, there is a struggle between hostile brothers uh, raging already about more than 400 years. On the one hand, we have seen there's a struggle of liberalism for personal autonomy, overcoming dependence, individual rights of freedom, private property, the market, of course, linked to, to the modern form of slavery, imperialism, uh, terrible wars, and uh, a, a fierce struggle against all types of the comments um, of all types of distribution according to the needs and so on. And on the other side, at the same time, in these 400 years, we have seen different forms, I think, of the struggle of communist tendencies against the structures of exploitation. And so I, I don't want to go into the details. For me, and this is the topic of my article, the first philosopher who concentrated on the problem with regard to modern complex societies with, with these opposing tendencies, the liberal tendency and the communist tendency for me is, is Hegel. He, I think it was the first to um, somehow in the line of Rousseau, I come back to Rousseau, to unite individual freedom and the rational ordering of society uh, and the negative freedom as he wrote with all these alienated relations, suppression and so on with um, a kind of higher freedom of common universe, universality. And um, I try to show, because it's, it's a volume on Marx, I try to show how Marx, as the most talented um, um, student of Hegel, uh, tried to, to recombine uh, uh, or to reshape the solution found by Hegel. Um, Marx um, started to solve this problem, uh, this problem um, um, with a reference to Rousseau, the distinction you all know between the bourgeois and the citoyen, and his line of argumentation in the, on the Jewish question, I think this is a founding, founding article of uh, Marx as a communist. He wrote it in um, 1843 and it was published in 1844 in the a German, a French yearbook. Uh, his line of invitation was the following. Human emancipation 
must align the reality of the vital activities of the individuals. And of course, in his mind, of course, individuals are more in the men-like uh, way. That means the vital activities of the individuals with their truth as common social be beings. That means he wanted to bring these opposing uh, uh, tendencies to be a free individual and to be in commonality with others together. And Rousseau said, okay, we do, should do it in a way that we are alienating all our forces, all the forces of the individuals, alienating and giving it to the common will. Marx reversed this answer and he said all emancipation is a reduction of the human world and relationships to man himself. And um, what is behind? I think he tried to combine, um, and as is very nice that Greg is, uh, Greg Clays is today here with us, um, two currents of um, socialist communist thinkers at this time. The first answer of Marx was together and based especially on, of course, on Charles Fourier and some others, a French socialist, he said, we must make the labor of the individuals and the, the individual relationships, uh, we must transform all these forms of labor and these relationships in a way that everybody can develop in a free way and is doing it in a way that he is supporting the creative solidarity development of all. But this is a one tendency. This is a Fourier-based tendency. At the same time, the second answer of Marx was, the second way of transformation is, he's, he referred to communist positions in the French um, uh, movement, where the idea of the transfer of the means of production to social ownership was put into the center. And there was also the idea uh, this should start as a political dictatorship. That means organizing society as a common unity, as a starting point then to transform the labor, the life, the relationships of the individual in the way uh, Fourier put into the center. Uh, the, I, I would say that Marx wanted, um, uh, wanted to establish an emancipatory solution of the fundamental problem of complex mo uh, modern societies. That means that in, in the capitalist time, the antagonistic uh, relationship between the free individual development of the few and the um, destruction of the common basis of our life, he wanted to solve it in a uh, on the basis of a socialist and communist foundation. Um, the, that means on the one hand uh, using, let's say, Foyer, for on the other hand, Babeuf, to, uh, to bring them together. Uh, somehow, uh, the, the behind this, and if we are looking to the, the concrete form, how Marx is uh, solving this problem, there is a, is a problem behind. And if we are looking on the influence on the Mark, on the Marx thinking and Engels thinking on the, um, on the um, uh, socialist and communist movement in the 20th century, the problems of um, the socialism and communism in the 20th century is much linked to the solution uh, Marx found in, um, nine, in 1843, 1844, because the, he wanted to solve the, 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 the contradiction between the in individual development on the one hand and the common development of all in a way that he wanted, on the one hand, a complete subordination of the individuals to a socially determined plan. His idea was all of us should be one common working force. In the capital, he's saying that in the, in the uh, free association, uh, all the uh, um, description of the work or the labor of Robinson are uh, 
becoming true, but for the social, uh, the, the whole society together. That means this, and this is very close to the ideas developed by Babeuf and the communist thinkers of his time. And then the, the second step should be in the second step, okay, we are developing then and changing, transforming uh, labor, life, and so on in a way that it becomes the all round development of the individual, supporting the all round development of all. Um, behind this is the idea of such a solution by organizing all forces as one force and organizing this one force in a way that everybody can develop in a free way. He is not solving the contradiction between the individual development and the development of all, but he is denying that there will be any contradictions in the future. And this is not a solution. He is a little bit, uh, he's not a little bit. He is like Alexander the Great when he was, um, he looked on the Gordian knot and just took his sword and um, destroyed the knot, but not solving this knot. Yeah? And um, I think it, the idea behind, and this was a very strong idea, um, in the, especially in the, in the communist uh, the, uh, movement in the 20th century, the idea behind was by abolishing the exploitive and antagonistic contra, uh, character of the contradictions of modern societies, we are abolishing all fundamental contradictions of modern societies. And this is um, totally impossible. And uh, uh, to come into, uh, to, to the end, I think we should draw one lesson. Often when we are speaking about Karl Marx in the 19th century, we are forgetting, uh, it is totally, almost totally forgetting there was a second most important uh, thinker at his time, and Marx was all the time opposing him. It was Pierre uh, Proudhon, yeah, the anarchism, the other side. We are concentrating, I think, with regard to these movements too much on, on uh, Marx and not enough on the on his, um, his um, he called him the false brother, his false brother uh, Proudhon. And I think uh, and Proudhon tried to develop a kind of libertarian or liberal socialism. If Marx tried to develop a communist socialism, um, Proudhon developed a liberal um, a type of socialism. I think when we are looking on the current contradictions of um, our civilization today, we need to combine and to bring together, really bring together in a self-confident way the liberal and the communist heritage on an emancipatory and solidarity uh, based uh, form. Uh, coming back to China, why China is so successful in the current situation? I think it is successful because it found at least for the moment and for the Chinese conditions, a way to combine totally opposing forms, liberal forms and communist forms. That means plan and the market, a common mission of the society with rule of law, leadership of the communist party and a high degree of individual liberty and so on. And when I'm looking on the Western societies, I would say if we in the West, in Europe especially, if you want to to support um, the solution of the ecological crisis and other crises and the, uh, fight the coming war, we should also we should be better able, based on of course on a civilization which is much more centered on on uh, the liberal tendencies, but we should bring back the communist ideas and the communist foundations into our society. This is the only chance to, to overcome the catastrophic tendencies of the future. And this is also the only chance to avoid that we will have again an ideological and economic and political and maybe military war between totally opposing ideologies of liberalism and communism. Thank you. Michael Bree, many thanks to you. Um, nice to have you as always. <clears throat> so 
Um, it was a very you know inspiring talk, and let's see what uh, what is going on now because we have already, I believe, four questions. I invite um, people to write their questions in the chat. It will be much easier, and uh, it, it is always nice if you say at least uh, where are you from or you know just one word to introduce who you are. I've also I'm seeing many colleagues that I know here. I also want to say that. Uh, uh, I've been approached recently by um, several journals uh, that want to review the book. So we are looking for reviewers. If you are interested, you will get a free copy of the book and uh, we will put you in touch with the journal. I included my email address in the chat. And uh, let's see, um, as I said at the beginning, we will read three, four, five questions and then we will go back to the um, speakers. I ask the speakers to be nice with me because we are already almost 325 and we have to compress the time we must end this uh, within 38 minutes from now we had also tremendous um, participation we don't want to end just a few of us so kira would you like to read uh, some of the questions that we received so far right yes um the first question so i'll read out three questions the first one comes from uh, jim granger Ooh. Sorry, the chat has just exploded. Um, yeah, Jim Granger would like to ask, um, since senses of community, my apologies, I did not realize the microphone was so far. Um, sorry, Jim Granger would like to ask, since senses of community and family seem to factor in many of the speakers' presentations and essays, do they see a role for the religious people who seek to build communities and families? If so, what role could people of faith currently play within Marxism, socialism at large, and communism? Uh, I also believe Olga Stefan has uh, broken up her question into two comments. Um, I can read it if you want. So Olga um, Stefani yeah. is asking, how does Marx view minorities' identities within this international worker movement? Um, on the Jewish question mentioned by um, Mr. Brie, Marx addresses Jews as an exclusively exploitative class being part of the bourgeoisie in Germany, obscuring the extreme poverty of Jews on the borderlands or in other parts of Europe. What can you tell us about this anti-Semitic perception Marx had at the time, which I know changed a bit later? So this is a question for Michael Brie. I also see, Kira, correct me if I'm wrong, um, three questions from Pirus Alemi, one, from, one for Gregory Clays and the second for Imani Banerjee and the third one for Silvia Federici. So everybody has his own attention. So one for Greg, on private property and communism, two on gender and capital, three politics and women and um, complicities by males outside of the factory system and racial system discrimination by capital volume one is not the place where Marx discusses this. And then there is a comment for Michael Brie on Alexander liberalism. Um, so a little bit confused. Um, difficult to answer when you know questions are telegrams like this but you know our speakers have all a lot of experience with this um kira any other question that we have now oh from Marx soderstrom right the one that you put in the chat yes so would you elaborate on the links between the environmental critique of marx the acceptance of ever expanding consumption and the gender critique of Marx, his failure to fully develop social reproduction to the question of the progressivity of capitalism. So I will say that there is um, enough material for our uh, speakers to have two, three, please maximum four minutes each, and then we can come back with, uh, with the questions, uh, with the last round of questions. Thank you. Oh, I, I must say that, uh, um, there is um, 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 Pirus Alemi, and uh, he wants to ask the question over the microphone, if possible, right? So, Pirus, if you are there, thanks to Babak, always helping me. Thanks to uh, Pirus. Are you there, Pirus? Pirus Alemi? 
You no? need to unmute idiot. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, may I yes. ask? Peter, so I just, yes, I just have to ask you to be kind with me. If you can compress the question within 90 seconds, I will be very, very grateful. Thanks. Okay, my first question is to Gregory, um, to Greg Clayes. And the question is, <clears throat> when Marx envisions communism uh, and he calls for the abolishment of private property, where do you think uh, he gets the idea of abolishing private property from? My second question is to Silvia <clears throat> Federici. And uh, I have a problem with uh, locating Marx's uh, writings about women in volume one of Capital. Um, my question is, if, if you have to solve this problem where women in Iran today cannot ride a bicycle or a motorcycle, they don't have the right to, to do so under a theocracy, how would you analyze that given volume one of capital? I think these two questions is sufficient for now. Thank you. Actually, it was excellent that you did these two questions because you are a model now for the speakers to be you know, as short and uh, concise as you were. So thank you very much. Um, let's do the same order. Greg, Imani, Silvia, and Mika. Gregory Clays, you go first, please. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the question, first of all. Uh, there are really two there that were directed to me. Uh, the first, which was just repeated again by Pyrrhus, where does Marx get the idea that abolishing private property is the answer to the problem, capitalism? Well, I think it comes from several sources. First of all, it's a series of logical stages, which Marx goes through. As we know, of course, it's Moses Hess who converts Engels as he passes through Cologne on his way to Manchester to communism. Marx follows his own trajectory. By 1844, he has established that there is a long and very thorough tradition of considering this, but equally that not all of his socialist contemporaries are communists. The most important, of course, is Owen, the, whose followers Engels confronts directly uh, from the autumn of 1842 onwards, they're extremely well organized. He sits at the feet of the local Owenite uh, lecturer and gets his first lessons in political economy from Owenism. As a consequence of this, he's faced really with the choice to go back to Marcello's point here about Fourier between systems of socialism which have mixtures of property ownership. That's to say some retention of private property, Fourier after all, still wants to give a percentage of the overall surplus generated by the financier to capitalists or the communist solution, which is Owens. Now, despite the fact that of course, one of the most important ruptures in this period in 1844-45 is the collapse of the most famous of all the Owenite experiments, the great Queenwood community in which Owen has invested not only all his funds, but so to speak, all his emotional energy, his moral fervor, the entire movement uh, rests uh, or, and rises or sinks with the success of this community and that community fails. The rupture here therefore for Marx is not between earlier forms of communism as such and his own version as it will be restated in the manifesto. The rupture is between small scale communitarian communism of the Owenite type principally and the status model, which is presented to us in the manifesto. So the second, that leads me directly to the second question. Can I elaborate more? Well, of course I could talk for uh, a very long time about what the environmental crisis means for everything that we've discussed here. The book that I'm uh, putting out in July does so at uh, far, probably far too great a length, but the problems are extremely complicated. Here, just to pick up the one point, uh, about property and the way in which property will be managed. I envision that we will be creating sometime around the end of this decade, uh, an international environmental commission to which all nations will willy nilly uh, easily or with great difficulty have to cede sovereignty. This will internationalize, but in, within nations nationalize all of the forms of resource exploitation, of energy generation, and so on. 
so that the implementation of an international program, first of all, to ensure sustainability by keeping fossil fuels in the ground, ending coal by the end of this decade at the absolute latest, this international body will come to stand in place of much of what the United Nations now does. That's my understanding of how in part the property um, question will be solved. But then finally, also the solution I propose is utopian, but in the same sense that I regard Marx as a utopian. Insofar as equality is the central principle already for Thomas More and for the vast majority of subsequent utopian writers, as well as the group often called, but I don't call them this, the utopian socialists. Equality will have to be institutionalized as a way of making the penalties and pains borne throughout the process of transition to sustainability, which will be very considerable for the wealthiest 1%, which mostly includes a lot of us, unfortunately. And the only way I think that uh, this system of the reduction of consumption, which is essentially what has to take place, an ant and a robust anti-consumerist movement of a type never seen before, led in the first instance by young people, not the traditional proletariat. That movement will uh, be the most effective in taking us down the road we need to go down. But Marx here is helpful. There is no doubt of that. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much, Gregory Cleese. And um, Kira, any announcement, sorry? Uh, none. I no, think so. Somebody else, I heard, okay. Sorry. So the next one is Imani. Imani Banerjee. Imani, three, four minutes. Can you make it, please? Thank you. Sorry. Otherwise, Imani, they will accuse me that we are both from York University, Toronto, you know? And I'll yeah, let you They'll think before. we're plotting together. Yes. And that's what will happen. But the questions asked could become whole books on their own. So I don't really know how to, you know, tackle them within this time, but I do want to point out a couple of things about Marx, which is that um, uh, having studied Marx's critique of ideology for a long time, and uh, I've discovered in Marx, or maybe artificially imposed on him, uh, investig uh, Marx's uh, role as an investigator, as a methodologist, and that whatever the content is that he picks up from his society, from current research and so on, is a different thing. So for example, coming from India, as I have, and being a woman, and I have written uh, about both these aspects of Marx's work in the last essay that I did for Marcello's volume on this. And what I'm saying is that, that Marx, by his own critique of ideology, which is a dehistoricizing, uh, obscuring of context, um, a way of thinking that the society takes up, not at a high level, interpretive way of thinking, actually can make any of us susceptible to whatever is the social prejudice or way of seeing in society. In that, from that point of view, I don't think none of, any of us are fully reconstructed outside transcendent of our society in terms of racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, et cetera. But with Marx, the interesting thing is that you can actually accuse Marx of being ideological, that is submitting to these kinds of uh, historic social ideas in his own time uh, without being very critical about it. That is, you know, it's true that he on hand saw that women were worker, you know, workers put, even volume one talks about the terrible suffering and the great role of women in becoming, uh, in putting industrial uh, capitalism in place and being kicked out when industries come. But at the same time, I think he thought that reproduction, family life, biological social life, almost automatically as being the province of women. 
And since there was a crisis of reproduction due to the civil war in England and rise of capitalism and so on, it just seemed like nobody wanted to deal with it, but left it on the lap of women as was prescribed in a patriarchal past and history. So Marx was both aware of the, the the concept of ideology or critique of ideology from Marx, I think allows us to criticize Marx himself for being ideological when it comes to the question of women. And at best inconsistent, because even in volume one, he talks about how women in are flaunting themselves around and living beastly social and sexual lives, but maybe a different kind of consciousness can arise from these kinds of unbounded women proletariat that are wandering around in the countryside of England at that time. He doesn't develop it. Uh, that idea that a new consciousness is arising among women. And yes, it does fall back to the notion of family wage and man as provider, woman as a producer, while millions of women were not in a position uh, to be so. Many women would have liked to have, I'm sure, been home and be provided for by their husbands while they do just the work at home and raise their children. The unfortunate thing about the most of poor in England and everywhere else in the world to this day, women do not have the opportunity to be the pro proper uh, social reproducer, if even in a sexist, patriarchal sense of the word. So I think to look at Marx in terms of his methodology and critique of ideology and other methods is actually one thing. And the another one is to see the content that about race, about gender, about many other things, he actually did not um, uh, arise totally or transcend from what was uh, you know, the practice or way of looking at women uh, in his time. I would say that would far down the road, someone like Lenin, uh, with the help of people like Clara Zetkin, Ines Arman, Alexandra Kolontai, and so on, had a much better understanding of this revolutionary subjectivity of women. So I think that's that's the thing. And as for religion, which someone asked, I think it's important, but it's true that uh, uh, religion forms communities, but what kind of religion and what kind of community does religion form? And uh, I think that, uh, the, you know, it depends on what is your notion of who can be included and excluded from your religious uh, purview. But uh, communities, uh, whatever they may be, I find in capitalism, the notion of class struggle to include the whole space of existence and struggle for our own existential time, which we do not wish to be alienated entirely or at all by any force from outside. I mean, in the end, the class struggle is a fight against alienation. And if religious in a way disalienate us from large groups of people, I would say that the more uh, universalist and socially inclusive the purview of religion, for example, that of the Sufis in the Shia community, Buddhists and others, maybe it can actually be. I mean, there are Buddhist Marxists in Thailand uh, who have included this liberation theology project, which, you know, also during the um, uh, fight in Guatemala and Nicaragua and so on, you know, in the base community of Christians, liberation theology did bring people together, irrespective of whether they were directly working class or not. I mean, there's really no recipe for revolution that I can find, but I think the more expanded we are towards uh, taking more space for our non-alienated life, demanding a full expression of our human capacities, the more meaningful the idea of revolution becomes. And I think Marx would have gone for that. That's all.
Thank you very much, Imani. Thanks. And um, still, since it is already 3.51, and I must end this by 3.55, I must uh, give the microphone back to, to uh, Kira and to Michael for, you know, final salutation, etc. I suggest that we incorporate a couple of other comments, questions that we are receiving now, and then we will ask um, um, Silvia Federici and Michael Bri to, to consider this if you are not uh, um, opposing to this. So I receive a question from Jack Dalton and Jack said, as we consider spaces of capitalism and their relation to the migration of workers, would you consider it appropriate to apply main takeaways to the modern university system within the United States? So, uh, you know, perhaps Silvia, also Michael, of course, can, can talk about this. Then there are other information about um, question of consumerism. I mean, everybody's uh, uh, free to read the chat. And there is also a question that I just, there is also a question that I just received from, oh, Imani, I think you must mute, from uh, Barbara Massais Costa. And Barbara is writing, the objectivity of Marx's study in Capital is the totality of internal relation of capital. The object of the study of the book is the cycle of evaluation of capital from production to realization to distribution. Capitalism externalized, the values labor that is not commodified. This capitalism that externalized in the values of reproduction, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think this is a, there is a question there, but thanks Barbara for the contribution and uh, um, the next two speakers will um, consider this as well. So Silvia, three, four minutes for you and uh, um, Michael Bri after you and then Kira and uh, Michael Lenner. Thank you very much. I will be very brief because uh, uh, clearly, I don't know, uh, Piros probably was referring to Marx's comments in the Communist Manifesto and some other work in which Marx is uh, critical of uh, the patriarchal character of the bourgeois family, the fact that the woman is treated as property or as uh, an instrument for the transmission of property. But what, what I was trying to, so this comment, and by the way, I. As, as I write uh, in this article and, and others, you know, the issue of the woman question was, was huge, you know, in Marx's time. It was in Fourier, it was in Owen. And, and so the fact that Marx has some references to and some critique to the patriarchal character of bourgeois relation, uh, it's really very much part of a broader, broader uh, critique of uh, that was taking place actually much, much wider. And uh, in, uh, in other works, for instance, Marx ha hardly ever mentioned women. And, or if he does, as Imani, you know, mentioned, uh, he speaks, for example, of prostitute in, in very, very negative terms. And uh, does not see, for example, the prostitute as a sex worker does not see, for example, the role the prostitution had in the reproduction of the workforce. When he speaks of the reproduction of the workforce, Marx speaks of fuel, piece of clothing, speaks of food, never, for example, even introduces sexes, though we know that uh, the, the male proletariat actually reproduced itself sexually, mostly through prostitution, uh, at least until the, the last part of the 19th century. So, Conclusion, Marx does not really investigate in any serious way uh, the material roots, the roots in the capitalist organization of work, you know, of capitalist patriarchalism, because patriarchy may, may precede, has preceded capitalism, but it has taken very specific form in capitalist society. Marx does not tell us what the specific force are. It does not analyze the material rules of um, you know, male-female relation. So he has a reference in volume one, which is really the one in which is only, the only volume in which he really speaks of women uh, about the fact that the male proletariat becomes you know, a, a slave owner because he sells, he sells his wife and sells his children to the factory owner. This refers to an early period of industrialization, but he does not investigate why, how, how come? How come you know, the male proletariat could actually sell his wife and his children, right? That meant the women did not enter capitalism on the same basis as men. 
men, the women did not own their labor power. They were expropriated from, from uh, you know, the, the commons, but they not liberated for exploitation. So Marx does not investigate all of that. This is why it's so fundamental to go beyond Marx if you want to understand, for example, you know, patriarchal relation, uh, capitalist patriarchy in the same ways it is necessary to do in order to, to ex understand you know, um, racial capitalism. I'll stop here. Thank you, Sylvia. And also thanks to Dave B, who wrote, I like the money on how women then and now were exploited in some way then and now, some ways that men were not um, then and are not now or experience the abuse of what is speaking very differently. Sylvia, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Um, otherwise, I will um, hear um, the echo voice coming back. And um, now, Mikkel, Mikkel, are you there? I'm here, so, yes. Are you as well? Um, uh, firstly, I want to, to uh, react to the position of um, Silvia Federici now. I think we should understand why Marx omitted all this. One may say he was just a, a, a machist, machist, yes, um, or a patriarch. Of course, he was a patriarch. No doubt, if he if you're looking on his own household, of course, uh, uh, he should have seen all these problems, but why he omitted it in the, his um, theoretical and political work? I think in, in his time, the working class movement in Europe, at least in England and uh, Germany and so on, was totally dominated by men. Uh, and his idea was, of course, I should work for the real movement at my time. Uh, I think this should be should keep in mind that he omitted a lot of things. As Rosa Luxemburg later said, the whole problem outside the inner circle of capitalist accumulation and so on. But this had a political logic behind. We should not forget because it's also important today. Today it's totally different. We know we have a huge ecological movement. We had this huge anti-colonial movement and um, in, in now post-colonial movement. We have a women movement and so on. This is a totally different time. So what he wanted to do, he wanted to support those movements he could support at his time. That's my first remark. The second concerning uh, the anti, the so-called anti-Semitism of um, of Marx. Firstly, of course, we all know his father was from a very famous um, Jewish family with a lot of rabbis behind and so on. And Marx's father has to convert to Christianity. Um, and in the article on the Jewish question, there are two lines of argumentation. The first is a totally liberal, because Bruno Bauer and others demanded that the Jews should first convert to Christianity because Christianity is superior to Jewish religion. And Marx said this is totally wrong. All religions are almost the same. And even if we are looking now closer, the Jewish religion, if we are taking it as it is seen in this time, or often as a religion of money, all of us were somehow Jews. All of us um, are um, um, deferring to, to money as God. So the, the first, of course, is a liberal tendency. He is de defending the right of the individuals to, to have their own faith and uh, religious groups. The second is a communist um, argumentation because he's saying, of course, all religions have, a, have this type of alienation um, um, of um, referring to God and so on, you know all this. And if we want to overcome such a situation where we have this type of alienation in the field of religion, in the field of uh, culture, in the field of uh, politics and in the economy, then we must change the basic um, uh, relations of our society. That means we must create a communist um, society. So I don't see any real anti-Semitic uh, tendencies in this. Of course, he was part of uh, the 19th century and you will find in his letters some remarks which are sounding very anti-Semitic, but in the real sense, uh, his own work um, uh, on the Jewish question is totally 
the, um, in the line of the, the most enlightened liberalism and the most enlightened and forceful uh, communism. Michael Bree, thank you very much, in particular for the historical contextualization on both gender and the Jewish question. And um, it is my time to end here the, this um, very uh, interesting and um, inspiring, useful book lunch. So first of all, I um, share with the people in the chat because I've seen uh, many colleagues here. So if you want to send them um, a book proposal, um, our book, Rethinking Alternative with Marx, that we are presenting today is the number 60s of the series that I direct, Marx Angus Marxism. So please send a book proposal to the email address mine and Babak Kamini, the editorial assistant of the series. Um, Babak and I are also starting just now a new adventure that is another series speaking of alternatives. The title of the series is Critique and Alternative to Capitalism. It is um, a series that will be with Routledge and the first books will be out in 2022. So contact us about that as well. Speaking of next things, Mikael, um, uh, you will end this, Mikael Lardner um, on behalf of a Marxist education project. I just wanna put in the chat the next event co-organized by you know, um, the um, Marx education project and also the, um, uh, I'm sure that um, hopefully Kira, you will be here with us again so we can have Shelter and Solidarity, a co-organized event next time as well. 